Dave? Dave? What are you doing? What's it look like? I'm cleaning the lab. Come on, we've got to do this I've intro. Got a doctor coming. I haven't got time for all this. <laughs> well, Dave's obviously cleaning the lab ready. Um, we do have a doctor coming, so let's crack on with it. Come on, Dave. Let's get this lab sorted then. Well, I'm doing my best here. Hi, Nigel. Hi, Dave. Welcome to my lab. Thank you very much. Nice of you to have me. And thank you for riding out. Yes, it was a bit freezing this morning, uh, but we made oh, it. Oh, oh. Well, that was the second time you saved my life. All in a day's work, Dave. Thank you, mate. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Which actually be a good start for us, for me and you, to talk about uh, being misdiagnosed. Because I was misdiagnosed with uh, exercise-induced asthma, with the breathlessness and had all the classic signs. Um, and then it turned out, after a few visits and scans, it, I had a faulty uh, mitral heart valve. Yeah. So there's a whole lot of really interesting things that come from us uh, sort of working to try and get you sorted out. Exercise-induced asthma is an interesting subject. There's also the business about how we provide medical care to our friends. If you're a doctor and you have a friend, how do you help them when they yeah. have an issue? And then, and then mitral valve disease itself and how it can show itself. So without boring your audience, maybe just ex I'm going to explore just a couple of those. Sure. So exercise induced asthma, almost everyone has it. So that's the first thing to say. If you go to a track cycling event and you watch people after they've been pursuiting, they're all coughing. Yeah. And they're all coughing because their bronchi are reacting to that dry air squeezing down and causing asthma. So to find that somebody has exercise induced asthma may be relevant to their breathlessness, but it's unwise to ascribe their breathlessness to it without thinking about other things. Sure. Uh, the second thing is that if you, know, if you get to this stage in life as a doctor, you'll often have friends and family members and they say, well, look, can I short circuit the normal stuff? Can you just tell me what's wrong with me? Or even can you just prescribe something because I've got this? And I got burned by this a few years ago. My sister-in-law's then boyfriend said, I've got back pain. And she says, just write him a script for some painkillers. And I did. Yeah. And then we discovered he had a leaking aortic aneurysm causing his back pain. And that was a really powerful, as the Americans say, teachable moment yeah, for me. So if it's your friend... You sit them down in clinic, you do the whole medical thing properly, history, examination, special tests, which is what we did. And the third thing is mitral valve disease. So uh, the body copes with a leaking mitral valve really well. Uh, and things may not be particularly evident with that person at rest. They may be pretty healthy unless they're in a sporting environment. And the thing that can be very telling is when the person has a leaking mitral valve, if you get them to exercise on a treadmill and ultrasound it, you can see that it's leaking uh, torrentially when they start to exercise. That exactly what happened when I was scanned on, on, on an echo. He got me on a, like a, pro, a bike and he almost said stop because the, the difference between resting state and then starting to exercise, the blood was all coming back into the chamber and causing all sorts of things to make me become breathless. That's right. And the oxygenated blood from the lungs comes into the heart, it comes into a chamber called the left atrium, which is like a, a tank or a sump. It then passes through a one-way valve into the main pumping chamber, the left ventricle. The mitral valve is very complicated in, but it, in its structure, but opens and shuts like a duck bill. And when you get a leaking mitral valve, often what happens is that one of these two sides flips backwards, right? 
So when the ventricle, which is pumping here, starts to pump more vigorously, that will push that one backwards a great deal more. All the blood goes the wrong way into the sump, the atrium, then backs up into the lungs. The lungs become engorged with blood. The person becomes breathless. And we could see all of that when we ultrasounded your heart. Yeah. And leading on from that, it's a complicated structure. And so it needs a master craftsman to repair it because you can cut the whole lot out and throw it in the bin and put in a mechanical valve. And if you're a sedentary person, that's an excellent operation. But if you want a heart that works well when it's made to work hard, you need somebody to repair it to give you what looks like a normal mitral valve afterwards. Yeah. Uh, and we uh, took advantage of my relationship with a very nice man called Frank Wells, who is a guru in this area. And Frank did a remarkable job for you. Did. So uh, what causes that to happen? Is it genetic or is it wear and tear? Or? Yes, you've, you've summarised the two reasons by asking the question. <laughs> Fair right, so everything wears out. Um, no 100-year-old looks in good shape, right? So everything wears out. The mitral valve is subject to huge forces 100,000 times a day, uh, but at the same time has to be thin, flexible, yeah. mobile. So it's not surprising that parts of it wear out. And you almost certainly had perhaps genetic, but at least a sort of built-in weakness that allowed that movement to become more exaggerated over the years and sometimes the little guy ropes that hold these bits in place can snap and then the whole thing is just flapping like a garden gate. Sure. So what would be for instance um, mammals, middle-aged men in lycra, mm. so, they, so they're, they're sitting in an office all day and all of a sudden they get a midlife crisis and they want to exercise. So we've talked just briefly on the, the athletic heart here, but we're now dealing with somebody that doesn't do a lot of exercise, watches the Tour de France and says, I'm gonna get a bike, and off he goes training for the attack. What sort of damage can that do, or is that good for them? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I work as a general cardiologist, but I have an interest in sport and cardiology because I do sport myself. Uh, and probably the commonest reason that people consult is that, scenario. So the person who may have been sporting when they were a teenager at university but have then spent the next 20 and 30 years earning it and now like they said a midlife crisis is an all existential thing that where they don't just want to do exercise they want to challenge themselves by riding like Alberto Contador or up the Col d'Isoard or the yeah. Tourmalet and do something which even in the world of professional cycling is considered to be extremely testing. And so it's potentially good for them because the athletic training that leads up to that will improve their health. Mm. And if they carry on with it, will improve their long-term prospects and less likelihood of having cancer and dementia and vascular disease. But in the short term, what it can potentially do is to reveal something that up to this point has been hidden. So a person may have quite advanced uh, disease in the arteries of their heart and the potential for a heart attack but all of that is entirely silent because in their life it's not tested. And so whether it occurs actually in the ETAP itself or, so, or rather on the 100 mile training rides that they're gonna to have to do, there's the potential, this massive ramp up yeah. uh, can, bite, can bite the person, can cause sudden death by the roadside and so on. So for me, if the person has been sporting all their life, I don't really do anything. I say this is a coaching issue, just go ahead. If the person has had this prolonged gap, then I think it's wise to do at least some testing of their heart to make sure there's not something that's hidden in there that's going to cause them harm. So it's a complicated picture. Yeah. Do you think, just for some advice going out there, is because with bike riders like us, we can fall back on experience. You know, we've got years of riding in our legs, years of racing, and knowledge and experience of suffering if you like yes. well somebody that's just taken up the sport and throw themselves into it they've got no knowledge they've almost got a mentality that if it hurts that's good they'll go as hard as they can yeah so you don't want to discourage people because you know in the broad sense riding a bike is a good thing for the world and a good thing for them but i i think it's a bit 
we see the same thing with running, don't we? That people take up running, maybe after many years of not doing anything, and then the next thing they wish to do is a marathon. Yeah. But if you come up through running, through cross country and athletics and so on, a marathon is an Everest, you know, it's, it's a huge challenge. And people might want to have 10 or more, more years of running in their legs before they attempt a marathon. And I think it's the same for bike riding. So why not enjoy riding a bike? Why not join a cycling club? Why not build it at a much more sort of believable ramp up sure. rather than say in six months time, I'm going to go from zero miles a week to doing 120 miles and 3000 meters of climbing. Yeah. So it, I, I think part of the, the narrative or the conversation you have with somebody in that situation is, just take a step back and realize what you're seeking to achieve here. And I think the difficulty with the attack, I mean, I've, I've never done it, so I'm speaking from a point of ignorance. I did the Marmot once and I was struck by how challenging that was, is that, yes, you can ride it slowly, except that that's 12 hours in the saddle. Sure. Temperatures on the valley fork, floor can reach 40 degrees, you can become profoundly dehydrated, you haven't practiced the nutrition for that type of thing. So whether you try and absolutely do it, and cane it and try and do it in the front group or whether you want to tap it out, it's still a remarkable challenge. And I suppose the start of the message for me with somebody like that is I really wouldn't underestimate this. Yes, that's right. Can you, can you actually spot an athlete's heart and a normal heart? Is there a difference? So I said the most common reason people sort of come to see me is this whole issue of huge sporting challenges and will I, am I up to it? The second common reason is that an athletic, so very different, but an athletic person has had heart tests and the heart tests have returned abnormal results. And then the question to me is, are these abnormal results unhealthy? Are they indicative of disease? or are they normal for an athletic person? And actually we're at a sort of frontier of medical understanding with this. Mm. Uh, some sports generate extraordinary looking hearts, uh, rowing particularly. <clears throat> some sports select people with unusual hearts. Miguel in Duran has made no secret of his extraordinary cow-sized heart uh, that allowed him to achieve those remarkable climbing are they just bigger? Yeah, bi bigger, but, 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 but not just bigger. But bear with me with that. So it's also uh, some sports select people who've been born with unusual physiology. And also people of different ethnic groups. So black athletes, uh, particularly uh, sprint athletes, so footballers, have hearts where it's very hard for all of us to really work. The ECG is a long way from what you would regard as a normal ECG. When you look at the heart itself, it's very muscular, but it's not particularly enlarged in terms of its volume. And so it presents a huge challenge, actually, because some of them will mimic what are known to be disease states. So there's a condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where the heart becomes extremely muscular and stiff and presents a risk of sudden death. And some athletic people's hearts, as I said, particularly people of uh, 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 black African and Caribbean origin, uh, the heart can look very similar to that. Hmm. And so that's a real judgment call uh, to make as to whether it represents a normal, normal for athlete or abnormal, you shouldn't do sport type yeah. thing. And so there aren't any easy, ready reckoner, normal ranges for these things. So I'm, I'm intrigued because whenever I've gone into hospital for whatever reason and I'm um, put up to the, the heart monitor that's pinging away. And every bike rider athlete will say the same thing. It, it, the alarm goes off. It's too slow. It's too slow. And the, and the nurses are running around, you know, and I'm saying it's normal, you know, yeah. I've got a 48 beat heartbeat, so what? But to them it's, the, the, is that because of the athletic heart or is it? So this is an interesting subject. I mean, well, I guess to me, all of these things you're asking me are interesting, but I find this one particularly interesting. So a quite a common way that this would come my way is the person is 70. They're referred up by their GP or by another physician. They say he's got a very slow heart, needs a pacemaker, perhaps. 
And then you say to that person, well, tell me about it. And they say, oh, well, you know, I uh, had a problem with my medical going into the army. I had a slow pulse, so it's likely to have been with them all the time. And often a useful second question is, were you naturally good at sport? Well, as a matter of fact, I was, yes. And so for this person, they have a constitutionally slow heart rate. Uh, there's natural genetic variation, just like, like there is with height and everything else. And so they're blessed with a broader heart rate range over which they can operate. So if you've got a resting heart rate of 40 and you can hit 200, you've got a heart rate range of 160, whereas if you've got a resting heart rate of 80, 80 and you can hit 160, you've got only half the same heart rate range over which you can operate. Therefore, the first person is likely to be able to generate twice as much the cardiac output during high intensity activity as the second person. They'll be naturally better at sport. Yes. So a very simple way of addressing whether this is just nat they're naturally lucky or whether they've got a disease causing an abnormally slow heart rate is very simple. Put them on the treadmill. Right. And if the heart rate ramps up appropriate, commensurate with the demands of exercise, well, that's just that them, you're lucky, no pacemaker required. Whereas if the same, <clears throat> same test is applied to the person who has a diseased sinus node, the bit that generates the heartbeat, it'll be a flat or a very shallow ramp. They'll have a poor effort tolerance and almost certainly that person will require a pacemaker, which electrically will allow the heart rate to ramp appropriate to the demands of exercise. So can you alter, if I, had, I was in the state where I needed a pacemaker and I want to ride my bike, it's quite often maybe my heart rate needs to go faster than the pacemaker. Can that be changed? Yes, it can. Uh, so the uh, old school pacemakers would really just pace you at a safe rate. Uh, then uh, the companies that manufacture them developed all sorts of quite sophisticated and smart algorithms which allowed the pacemaker device itself to detect how much you were doing and therefore ramp the heart rate up to match what you were doing. And we've also, and those electronics are tunable. So when we talk to the pacemaker, and I've had this with several uh, athletes of your age and my age who've ended up with pacemakers, but they've got a problem because it's maxing out at 150 and they want to be at 180 in order to be in the mix in the race. And so we've been able to tune it and give them a much higher heart rate. <laughs> so I love it. So it's sort of electronic doping. Yeah. Uh, but there's so many symptoms, isn't there, with hearts that can, it, it varies into so many different categories. Another example, which I've experienced, and it, again, it goes along with the breathlessness, is the atrial fibrillation. Yeah. And, and also the difference between what I had, I atrial flutter, and it had a similar... Um, feel with the breathlessness to the fibrillation. Yeah. What is the difference and why do we get that? So it's in the last 15 years, it's become big news. And I think it's become that for two reasons. The first is an increased awareness and recognition. So I started work with a friend of mine, Greg White, who's a sports scientist 20 years ago at the British Olympic Medical Center and we started to find older athletes with much more atrial fibrillation than you would expect. So Greg and I were actually the first people to start talking about this. It's now widely recognized that masters athletes have five times the risk of atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter compared with sedentary people. Mm. And the second reason is that many more people now want to carry on sporting endeavor beyond the age of 30. They want to carry it on beyond the age of 60. And so there's also many more people, as, if you like, now getting this athletes-related AF. So that's the, the reason it's become more visible. And the reason I think we're still speculating, but here's my take on it. So we talked about left atrium takes blood from the lungs, passes it into the left ventricle, the pump. The left atrium can accommodate up to six-fold increase in volume uh, pumped through the system as the person goes from rest to high intensity work. And if you inflate a balloon and deflate it and do that hundreds of times, you end up with a balloon that won't go back to its original volume. So it's lost its compliance. And the left atrium is just the same. It ends up as a saggy enlarged bag. And although that doesn't affect the efficiency of your heart as a pump, 
what it does do is it makes the atrium more prone to go into this chaotic pattern of electrical activity, atrial fibrillation. And so that's the sort of concept as to why athletic people are getting this. Atrial flutter is similar but not the same. In fact, atrial flutter tends to cause many more symptoms than atrial fibrillation, in my experience. So atrial flutter also comes from an atrium, but this time the right atrium, which, comes, which takes deoxygenated blood from the body and passes it on, up to the lungs. And the right atrium develops an abnormal electrical circuit, which cycles at 300 beats per minute. Uh, and periodically the heart will, this abnormal circuit will start firing and the heart itself won't bump beat at 300 BPM because that wouldn't work very well for very long. But what happens is that the main pump goes at a ratio. So you might get a two to one where the uh, ventricle pumps at 150 or a three to one at 100 and so on. But all of these make the heart inefficient during the time the person has the abnormal rhythm and heart inefficiency equals breathlessness and fatigue. Can it start in resting as well as exercise? So you get different, so just to talk about atrial fibrillation, so you get three patterns, interestingly. Uh, you get one where it's uh, in the context of exercise. So it's probably adrenaline driven. So uh, when we go to the uh, uh, master track, Masters Track Championships, I can point to you several competitors whom I've looked after who get AF during their races. So that's adrenaline driven type right. AF. The second pattern is the opposite. It's the AF occurs in the space between normal heartbeats when the person's at rest. So the person will say to you, I have my dinner, I sit down and watch telly, and then I go into AF, and very characteristic. And here the vagus nerve, which slows the heart, is somehow involved in triggering the AF. And then the third pattern is entirely random. But for everyone that gets AF, it starts off as rare bouts and they don't know what to make of it. And then they become common bouts where it's starting to become apparent that there's an issue and it becomes easier to diagnose because you can witness them through to incessant. And so the thing for us as heart specialists when we're addressing this, if you want me to talk about how we try and treat it, is you're going to start by medicating it. When the person has a certain, more than a certain amount of it, you also need to give blood thinners because what can happen during the chaotic electrical activity is blood clots can form within the heart and then fly off and cause stroke and other harm. So you want to give medication which prevents it happening. You want to give it a blood thinner which prevents the complication of having it. But these days, earlier on in the person's career with AF, we're thinking about ablation, where in the ablation process, we're actually going into the heart and seeking to electrically isolate the bits of the heart that trigger the abnormal rhythm, and for some people at least, cure it. And the good news for you and the other flutterers um, is that ablation is a highly effective therapy, nearly always curative. So the fibrillation is more complicated? Yeah. Several of my friends have had sort of three or four or five goes. <laughs> yes, that's right. It's a it's a project, not a one once a one off event. Yeah. Uh, and again, the the detail of it may be of limited interest. But the, in atrial flutter, I talked about that circuit. Yep. It's easy to find, and once you can just do a little burn within the right atrium, you can interrupt the circuit, and the job is done. With atrial fibrillation, you have a much more complicated job to do. So what you've actually have to do, the five veins that come into the atrium from the lungs, each have to be identified, and then you have to deliver a little burn in a circle at the point where these veins join the left atrium in order to prevent the transmission of electricity. Uh, and as you can imagine, in three-dimensional space, deep inside the heart, not burning too much, but burning enough yeah. in order to deliver this radio frequency energy is a hell of a job. So you would always say to the person, this works for most people, it doesn't work for all, but you've got to prepare yourself for the fact that it's a project may need several goes at it. Right. So with either of these, is, is it an age thing, generally? Yeah. So in the animal kingdom, uh, the... Uh, Creatures that live to a great age, like tortoises and elephants, all have AF. Right. Didn't know that. There you go. Yeah. 
And so it's part of normal aging for the human as well. So people, we're talking about people who are 100, uh, you know, they're, not, they're, ne they're never look in good shape. Uh, they've all got AF or give or take okay. and so on. So to some extent, it's an age related thing. What about aging um, away from that? The, the, the older you get, in theory, you start to slow down. So um, in my case, you take my health away from one side, um, I was holding a good fitness right through my 50s and there was not a lot of decline. In fact, my challenge was to go as fast as I did last year or the year before. And then all of a sudden I fell off the cliff and my form just went boom. Whereas some of the other athletes, they were just losing it gradually, their, their, their top end. Mine just, is there a reason for that? I don't think we know. So when I've seen, and I guess this would be typically people in their 60s and 70s, and they've, perform, and they've often been internationals, world class uh, as, as seniors and they'll say I've, it's a bit like you they say I've maintained a pretty good form I've still been able to beat my age group uh, peers and then it's like that it's not like that uh, and I've, I've certainly seen it in often often enough to think that it's a definite thing which as yet is unexplained so for a minority of people, you could say, well, this is a disease, this is a specific condition, you know, maybe something like they've got anemia or something like that. But for many, it's an unexplained drop off. So although you've got to say in a, in a, a vague sense and that it's age related and you can quote all this stuff that, uh, you know, you lose skeletal muscle, you lose uh, uh, explosive power, you lose strength with aging. There's a lot about it that's completely unexplained, I would say. Yeah. I think also the, uh, the, the, the mental side of it too, for some people, will be quite dramatic, especially if you was an international bike rider yeah. and you're, you're riding a crest of a wave, the next minute you're crashing down and looking up. Uh, psychologically, it could be quite hard to deal with, seeing all your peers that you used to beat. Uh, right. And now they're walking all over you and you're, you're scratching your head wondering what's going on. There's a broader thing there as well. So a lot of people would come and see somebody like me, not so much that we offer special expertise, but more that we're, we're sympathetic to their perspective, mm. particularly for cyclists, but for some other sports people as well. The cycling is as important in their life as their marriage, their family, their job and so on. So when they've consulted a colleague and they said, well, I get this, I get that, and it's affecting my bike riding, the messaging they'll be getting is, well, what did you expect? Yeah. And so, and I suppose their internal response is, my expectation is that I want to continue riding my bike until I die, as it were, or hopefully not too early. So I think part of the reason they come to see me is that I have the same expectations for myself. So going through the mentality and mindset how does it affect um, you as a person? Because this is something that I'm, I'm really interested to hear your answer. So I'm going to put, put you on the, on the spot here. So one of our training sessions we had at the Velodrome, um, we were training together and you turned up and I was about to speak to you and you sat down and you said, give me five minutes. And I did. And, and you apparently had just come out of theatre. You, you went from one environment to another environment, which was velodrome. So I'm, I'm actually keen to know, asking the top man that works on hearts, got years of experience. He obviously have got your mentality, your nerves, your control, under control in theatre, because you have to be. Mm -hmm. Is there a different environment when you go to a bike race? Because you've still got pressure. You've got all the things, you've got your adrenaline, you've got pressure, you've got nerves, and you know, you've got this thing that you've got to do it, got to get it right to win. What's the difference? Yeah, we had a little talk about this previously and it, it sort of prompted me to reflect on what the difference really is. And so I, I, think, I think I can explain it. 
So if I'm doing procedures on people's hearts, it isn't always easy and it sometimes it isn't successful, but I feel I'm the master of it. And furthermore, I'm there with a group of people, a team of people whom I work with, and they would look to me to be calm and to be in control and to run it. And so in sport, people talk about this sort of flow state of mentality where you're internally calm, uh, where things not exactly feel effortless, but you feel in control of them and you feel a confidence that you're going to achieve a good outcome. So that would almost be a default setting, not that I'm an exceptional cardiologist, I'm sure I'm not, but that would be a default setting for me in my working environment. The thing that keeps me coming back to the track, and that I'm not a great cyclist, but I can still sometimes win things on track, the thing that keeps me coming back is that I have no idea whether I'm going to win, lose, or come somewhere between the two. And so that uncertainty, the challenge of it, it really it causes a high state of anxiety beforehand. Mm -hmm. You've really got to give of yourself. It, it's quite uncertain through the whole process of the race, how it pans out, whether I get onto the right wheel in the last lap but one, whether I can then come off that wheel on, you know, in turn three before the bell and then win the sprint. And so, the uncertainty of that and the fact that I'm with people who can beat me on many occasions presents quite a different mental environment for me. And although it's, it's stressy and causes anxiety, those rare occasions when you win more than compensate for all those uncomfortable sensations beforehand. But I certainly, I'm certainly not confident. I'm certainly not, if you like, in control of the situation. But what that, would you be like in a team race? Because I've seen you rock up and ride a team pursuit, win and go home. Yeah. Um, and you, you, from my experience, you behaved differently. You're almost behaving like you are what you've just explained in theatre, where you've got your own team that you, you work with. Yes. And, and, and you're yeah. probably in the mindset of that in your team pursuit, for instance. So I think... When you pointed that out to me, I thought that was so insightful because I hadn't thought of it myself. So I've done a fair amount of team pursuiting. I've made very strong friendships with the various teammates that I've had doing team pursuiting. You have to, you, I mean, these are sort of cliches, but nevertheless true about working in teams. So the team is only as strong as the weakest member of the team. You have to give of yourself. You should not be selfish. It's particularly true in team pursuiting. If, you, if you're in great form, you need to acknowledge that and not ride the other people off your wheel because that will ruin the race. And, and you would also need to be mindful that if one of your teammates has turned up and not in such good form, you need to respect that, as it were, and you sometimes need to calibrate the turns they take. So all of that creates a sort of mental space where you've got, a, if you like, a hive mind and not an individual selfish mind. Yeah. Uh, and it's a great place to be. I would commend team pursuiting to anyone. Very it's different, it, very similar mentality, sounds. Yes, it, it, there's lots of parallels. And the business about presenting the best of yourself to your other team members and not being selfish it is important, for sure. Finally, there's just one thing that I think would be close to a lot of people that we know. Um, is a sudden death syndrome with, with youngsters and we know a couple ourselves uh, it's a very sad thing is there any way of scanning or spotting this or is this just something that happens and then yeah the extent to which you can know it might happen yeah that's uh, and whether therefore if you can spot it in some people whether you should look for it in all people in order to prevent that tragedy. And the, the problem with almost, even with talking about this, is that all of us that are parents know that the worst thing that could happen in your life, bar none, is the death of your child. And so I think for somebody like me to talk of this subject, I need to talk respectfully of it because I share as much as you can, the pain of people who've lost a child and their desperate need to find any sort of meaning 
in an awful thing. So that will drive people to say, well, surely screening would be a good thing. One life saved is worth tens of thousands of people looked at. Surely that should be so. And the, and the, and the, the arguments, or at least the things to think about with that, are a bit complicated to convey. But maybe just a couple of thoughts before we just uncritically throw the house at screening. And the first is that you can detect minor anomalies which may not be a great risk for anything in that person's life but can end up precluding them from sport and therefore may prevent them from getting all the health giving benefits and the disease preventing benefits of a lifetime of participation in sport. And certainly we see in other countries where sporting, where screening for cardiac things is uh, uh, mandatory at all levels of sport participation. I suspect the net effect of that is that many people are denied the benefits of sport. But the second much more complicated thing is that it's difficult to screen for rare things. So, so we've seen this, the arguments around this we've seen a bit with lateral flow tests in the whole current COVID thing. Once a high percentage of the population has COVID, lateral flow tests become an extremely accurate way of diagnosing COVID. If COVID is rare in the population, the same test, the lateral flow test, becomes a very inefficient test for COVID and you get a much higher percentage of false positives. In other words, you tell the person they have the condition, whereas in fact they do not. So the same test can be more or less meaningful according to whether the thing you're looking for is common or rare in the population you're looking for. So to return to sudden death, there are a number of conditions which you can screen for. All of these are rare. All of them are super rare. There are a number you can screen for where you can absolutely diagnose it with screening. There are some, you, some others where they may or may not have it on the basis of your screening test and you can't tell in life whether that is so. And there are many where it's there and we have no meaningful test for it yet. So I think all I would say around this matter is that it's complicated and our sort of intuitive sense that it must be right to screen athletes for things because we want to avoid the tragedy of a child dying. It isn't as straightforward as that. No. Wow. I don't know, I don't know if that's helpful or not. No. Of course. Well, thank you for coming. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. I mean, you rode out as well. That's, that's quite a big deal. Is well, no, it's all right. It's, uh, it, I'm uh, using my uh, <laughs> time management skills to get a century ride in and do this. Yeah. Oh. Okay, then. Just a couple of things. What? Campag or Shimano? Yeah. So when I did it as a teenager, Campag Super Record, it looked beautiful and it worked best. Now, not sure about the aesthetics of the modern electronic campag and the Shimano works much better. There you go. Brown sauce or red sauce? Brown every time. Bacon and brown. What's your favourite film? Ooh. So, only allowed one? Yeah. Apocalypse Now. There you go. <laughs> Still smell the, the smell of napalm. <laughs> I love the smell of napalm in the morning. There you go. Charlie can't surf. Yeah. Charlie yeah. don't yeah. surf. Yeah. I'm sure he could. <laughs> Anyway, on that note, thank you for joining us, Nigel. It's a great pleasure, Dave. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. He wants us to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> One more time. <laughs>